Shall I come closer, brothers? Mindful of those, if there's still someone praying salah, try and come as close as possible. الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا إلى الصراط المستحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله الطاهرين وأصحابه الكاملين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون صدق الله العظيم قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الدعاء مخ العبادة First and foremost, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the ability to make the most of this holy month of Ramadan. We should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala profusely for giving us another opportunity, another Ramadan. Today is the second fast. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it, accept our taraweeh, accept our Quran recitation, zakah and sadaqah and give us the ability to do more. So today's program, it's... It's going to be slightly different, I'll mention that first. Um, I know normally we expect a bayan. So the topic was get your du'as answered. How to get your du'as answered. Um, a lot of the things we do is based on du'a. For example, a person, let's say he's young, he's in school. He has GCSEs coming up soon and he's going to make du'a for it. When he leaves school, he'll make dua that he gets into a good college. After college, he'll make dua that he goes to a good university, he gets a good job. Then he'll make dua that he gets a good wife or she gets a good husband. So a lot of these things are based on dua. A lot of our life revolves around dua. Islamically, religiously, if you look at ibadat, also a person, after salah, what did we all do? Make dua. So consciously or unconsciously, we are always making dua. Even those uh, masnoon duas, you read when you come into the masjid, before eating, after eating, sleeping, those are duas. Whether you call it dhikr or dua, you're asking Allah to uh, seek protection from shaitan, these are duas. So we realize dua is not a Ramadan thing. It's not something you just do in hajj or after salah. It's something every single Muslim spends a lot of their life doing. But having said all that, I'm sure every single one of us sitting here, mothers and sisters listening at home, will have at least one dua or maybe more which hasn't been answered. Is that correct? Or does anybody feel here, mashallah, all my duas have been accepted? Then he can do the bayan and teach everybody. So we all have those du'as. And it's not something bad. It's not because we're bad Muslims, because we're not pious, because we're sinners. There were pious people, pious predecessors, people from the Salaf Salihin, who used to make du'a sometime for 10 years, the same du'a. 15 years, the same du'a. 20 years. And when they were asked, why do you keep making du'a? They said, yeah, Allah has not given me yet. And I've not given up. That's the difference between us and them. 20 years, imagine that. 20 years. This is recorded in the books. The famous scholar used to make dua for 20 years. Allah never answered and said, Allah has not given me yet, but I'm not giving up. That's hope. That's patience. Hamara hal 20 minute dua karte hai, aur kal natija chahiye. Kabhi account mein paise nahi aaye. Dua to baut karte hai. So, there's many reasons why du'as don't get accepted. Inshallah, we'll go through that. But I will mention, there'll be a lot of things which sometimes you might be asked to do something. Um, and it's if you want to, it's no pressure. It's just something which I've learned from many ulama that sometimes there's different ways. There's, you can make a du'a, for example, the traditional way, having a set of 15, 20, 25 du'as from Quran and Sunnah. Nothing wrong with that. But that's not what I'm going to teach you today because everybody knows that. You can pray all the Rabbanas, you can pray these dua books. What I'm going to teach you today, inshallah, and tomorrow we will continue, is 
you're going to make dua for only a few things. Five or six. That's the number we give to people. Five or six duas. And ideally, this is why I said you'll be asked to do something, is write them down, which is the old school way or the modern way. If you've got a mobile phone, so you don't have to do it now. If you want to do it now, you want to do it through program, because of what I say, you might remember something and think, you know what, yeah, I, I, I need this. But there are going to be du'as that are relevant to you and something where you can see a result. So for example, I'll give an example which you, part of those six du'as, you can't write, Allah give me Jannat. Why? Because you can't see that result. These six du'as you will make for six months. Six months maximum. If you get a result in six months, then you stop. You might get one result straight away. The sixth one, you might not get. So you, there won't be du'as like, oh Allah save me from Jahannam, oh Allah grant me Jannah. Which some of you are thinking now, the main thing of fasting and Ramadan, that's why I said to you, it's going to be a little different. If you want to make that du'a in your own time, that's fine. But what I'm going to teach you, inshallah, it's mainly those du'as which don't get answered. Something you really want. So it might be for somebody who's 16 years old, the GCSE. You can do because in August you're going to get the results. So that's possible. For somebody who's not married, six months you might get married. Somebody who doesn't have children, these are the sort of du'as where you can see instant results. So, like I said, if you want, you can do it now. You can do it when you go home. But do it. Try it. And if it doesn't work, then what normally happens? You get your money back. Inshallah, you can get your money back from August after 14 days. So it's a different technique of making dua. Some of you will find it difficult, I'll be honest with you, simply because we're used to the traditional method, like the Imam Sa'ad did after Salah, and there's nothing wrong with that. So those are your du'as of Jannah to save you from Jahannam and things for the Akhirah. But these six things will not be things for the Akhirah, except, I'll give you an example, if somebody says, Oh Allah, let me die with a clean heart. We might accept that as one of the six du'as, simply because... What you're asking, clean heart, what's a clean heart? What does a clean heart mean to you? Anybody? There's nothing out, yeah? Okay, okay, there's nothing out of there. So what could come out of the dirty heart? Blood? Spiritual maladies, mashallah, I think is answered all, all in one. Spiritual maladies, yeah? Anger, arrogance, pride, hatred, jealousy, you know the sort of things we went and work on in Ramadan. So if somebody makes dua, so even though really it's to do with the hereafter, because in the akhirah you will know who had a clean heart. Clean heart isn't wearing a white jubba and having a beard like I do. That's not a sign of a clean heart. Yeah? Abu Jahl had a beard. Abu Jahl had a beard, or generally the Arabs had beards. So having a beard is not a sign of a clean heart. Wearing white clothes or long jubba is not a sign of a clean heart. Clean heart is, as the brother said, free from spiritual maladies. So for example, let's use one example. You can't forgive people. Yeah, sometimes it's hard. Let's be honest. Um, in Ramadan, we talk a lot about forgiveness, but forgiveness is big. There could be somebody who parked in your driveway... Which, which might be big, but I'll say that's small. And then there's somebody who's robbed your money. Somebody who's mistreated your son or daughter. Those things are big. So to forgive them, it's not easy, is it? That's the sort of heart you're asking for. That Allah, give me that heart that I can forgive people. Give me that heart that I'm not jealous. Somebody's got a better car than me, better house. Somebody looks better than me. So that's a clean heart. So those are possibly one of the du'as you could put. But that's just an example. The example is that you don't put things which you can't see results. Those you du'as make separately. But for this task, six du'as, think of them inshallah. Tomorrow I'll ask you who's done it. Homework. No, you don't have to share these du'as. But I will ask tomorrow just to see who's done it. And if you can't think of six, put one thing down. Everybody has one thing. 
Right? So one thing. And then we're gonna then there's a few different things, techniques of making this dua we're gonna I'm gonna teach you as well. That people who've tried this rather than the traditional way of sitting after salah on a musalla and just make dua 15, 20, 30 duas, we're not concentrating, they don't mean anything to us, we just repeat it. That's the difference. In case somebody objects on me, say, What do you mean I've been making this dua for fifteen years? My father made this dua, grandfather made this dua, no problem. But also try this way of six du'as. Now, one of the things about these du'as is, when you make this du'a, not all the time, but once, you need to go out of your comfort zone. Out of your comfort zone is not in the masjid. And if you want it to be a masjid, you go to another masjid. Biggest masjid in Bolton. It doesn't have to be the biggest, but just say, a nice masjid. Or you've gone abroad somewhere. Yeah, you go to these UAE countries, you say these nice masjids. So you, you don't have to specifically go, but let's say you're going there, you make these du'as there. Or any nice masjid, somewhere in England, you've gone for traveling or on holiday, you make these du'as in that masjid. So what am I doing? I'm taking you out of your comfort zone. Rather than pray in your bed at home, it's the same with the women and sisters at home. Rather than just pray the du'as at home, so you go to first is a nice masjid. Obviously, the best of all masjids is, in the world, Masjid Haram. Yeah? So if someone's going for Umrah or Hajj plan this year, they can do the du'as there. Once. You only have to do it once. You can do it other times. So that's one of the techniques that you don't just make du'a at home. If, for example, somebody doesn't travel, they're not going anywhere this year. And I've told you within the next six months, these du'as should be answered. Then you don't make this dua at home, you don't make it in a masjid, you go to a nice place, a scenic place, make these duas. And I'm sure there's plenty in and around Bolton. So you go to a park, it doesn't have to be fancy, you go to a park and make dua. Any, anybody ever made dua in a park? No. See, this is why we're changing the setting. Do it. And if you can't remember, write these things down, because there's quite a few things that will help you inshallah so for example common i think for asian people is the lake district yeah, everybody goes to the lake district once or once in your life you've been i wouldn't say blackpool blackpool is not the best place to make dua you might get somebody's bad dua there so a nice place like lake district is, is a good example or it's common place any park where there's nice scenery mountainous route, lakes, rivers. It's up to you how you make that dua. You could put a musalla down, you can face the qibla. If you don't know the qibla, you could stand up and make that dua. So that's one of the things. The so first thing, you're going to write the six duas down. Second thing, you're going to try different places. Um, if somebody is really adventurous, they could try every week, every two weeks, different locations. I'm making it easy for people that once you make it in that big masjid or the scenic place or once you go um, to a different place not just local now sometimes people ask when I've done this previously that, what are you talking about? you've broken so many normal traditional ways of making dua did the sahaba do this? have you ever heard the sahaba did this? it's a common question nowadays with everything isn't it? Has anybody already had that thought in the head? Feel free, because I'm, I'm going to answer it anyway. So if you had that thought, that what's this guy talking about? Sahaba didn't do this, they didn't go up the mountains. Gee? Okay, they, they went up mountains, but not to make the dua. Not for, not for this sort of things, what I'm saying. So he's right, they went up mountains, yeah, they fought in Badr and Uhud. So that's one answer. There's many things we do that the Sahaba didn't do. Yeah? And the first one, which is coming very soon, your lavish iftars at home, mashallah. Show me, and obviously no photos, but one description, the Sahaba had lavish iftars like that. Non-existent. Dates and water. Still do it every day, don't we? And the increase, the iftars increase, day two, day three has to be better, day seven has to be totally different. If your wife makes the same samosa as she did on the first day or the same dish, we've had that once already this week. Do you not know I'm fasting? So there's many things we do, we eat, we drink, the selection of drinks we have. That's just one example. Yeah, the mobile phone in your pocket, the Sahaba didn't have. But another way of answering that 
is how much time and effort did the Sahaba make behind dua? Or how much time and effort should any Muslim make behind making dua? Such a big thing which I've said at the start, it's like the center of our lives. You have a problem in your household, dua. Yeah, your kid's not well, dua. Sometimes husband and wife have an argument, you regret it, you make dua. I don't know what my husband's going to say when he comes home. I don't know what my wife's going to say when I go home. Dua. Dua is everything. Dua is not always raising your hands. You make this dua consciously or unconsciously in your heart and your mind. So somebody might say to me that what you've said I've never heard before, but my answer will be that how much time and effort have you spent studying dua, how to make dua? We haven't. The truth is we haven't. It's just been taught from generation to generation, like I said, those set of du'as, which there is absolutely nothing wrong with. If somebody just prays the 40 Rabbanas or a set of Rabbanas every day in Ramadan, no problem. But then my question to him will be, how many of your du'as are accepted? And that's the purpose of this talk, is getting du'as accepted. And if they're not accepted, why? So first and foremost, I'm going to mention a hadith. I'm going to mention this at the start, well, kind of starting, and mention it at the end as well. This is a hadith, every time you make dua, especially these six duas, but generally when you make dua, you're going to remember this hadith. So when we're making dua, who are we asking from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What other names do we know of Allah? Rahman, Rahim, good. Anybody else? Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, okay. Assalam. We're getting going now. We've got what, nine left, nine till ninety to go. Some of the younger boys. The name of Allah. He's worried. I'm asking him or the one behind him. Sorry, which one? Jabir. Jabir, mashallah. Any name of Allah? Al Wadud. Wadud, mashallah. You know the name of Allah other than his name? Al-Aziz, okay, mashallah. So we know names of Allah. That's one thing we need to implement, which often we don't do. When you listen to the taraweeh in Makkah and Medina, you will often hear, when they make dua, they use a lot of these names. Not in abundance, but they will say, Ya Aziz, Ya Ghaffar, yeah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. It's something, if you don't know all 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, learn 10, learn 9. Ramadan's a good time for memorizing as well. Because you're fasting, your memory is at its best when you're hungry. So memorize the names of Allah, three a day, times 30 is 90. After Ramadan you can learn another nine. Try and memorize the names of Allah. If you can't memorize all 99, tomorrow's task inshallah, 10 names of Allah. If you already know 10, you've done your homework. 10 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any order, any 10 names. Try and remember them. That's not for me, by the way. I'm not going to ask you to say them, but I will ask tomorrow who's learned those names. Simply because it's part of dua. Yeah, there are certain names mentioned in hadith, for example, Ya Dhal Jalali Wal Ikram. The Prophet ﷺ, he was heard to repeat this name. Ya Dhal Jalali Wal Ikram. Qayyum is another one. Rahman, Rahim is another one, common name. Yeah? So when we're making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to know who he is. This is one re big reason I think our du'as are not accepted. Our mind is not focused, heart is not focused. Allah give me this, Allah give me this. I mean, Allah give me this. Nili iftari time, nili iftari time. I don't want to say never, but it is a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said that du'a will never be accepted. Kalbun ghafil. That your heart is unaware of what you're saying. It's a hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah will not accept the du'a of the heart which is ghafil, unaware. You don't even know what you're saying. You're just focused on the clock. The iftari time is going to come, what are some I'm going to have at home, what am I going to do after iftari, where am I going to go after taraweeh, etc, etc. That's not dua. Most of us make dua like that. Let's be honest. This is the purpose of today's talk, is improve your dua. So I mentioned there's a hadith I'm going to say, which I'll say at the start and say at the end, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions... That the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, that Allah says, if all of creation, so how many human beings approximately in the world today? 
7 billion, 7.5 billion give and take, let's say 7, at least at a minimum. 7 billion, so that's not 7 billion. Allah is saying the whole of creation from Adam alayhi salam to the last person born. So that's going to be billions. Billions of people stood on a plane. Yeah? Some land, wherever it is. Let's say the plains of Arafat. Yeah, when there's millions of people. Allah is saying, if all of mankind stood, raised their hands and asked me, I will give every single person what he wants. Who's heard of this hadith before? Yeah, you hear it often in bayans and things. This is a hadith you will remember when you make dua. Every time, or at least when you're making these six duas. The who are you asking from the being who says, I can give billions of people every single person, every single thing what they want. Not just one thing, every single thing what they want. Have you ever thought of this hadith when you make dua? No. Because we think we're doing business. Give and take. With Allah, it's not business. Allah, one of his name is Ghani. Yeah, Allah, his name is Ghani, Mu'ti, the giver. So when Allah's name is Ghani and you know it's Ghani, yeah? the most rich, the Mu'ti, the giver, Allah doesn't take anything from us. Yeah, when you, it's, that's why it's not business. If Allah answers your du'as, He's not going to take something from your bank account. This is the hadith you need to remember that Allah is the one who says, I can give all of mankind everything He wants. So why can't He give six things? Can you see how we need to change mindset? That's why you're only going to make six. And once they start getting answered, then you make another six, you add to the list. But this is why there's a reason for six. Because this is another objection people have. Why six? You just said Allah can give everybody everything. So why six? It's a good objection, isn't it? You just contradicted yourself. The hadith says Allah will give everybody, you say only six. It's because you will focus on these six. Can you see what I said at the start? We have this set list. Whether you know the Arabic, whether you know English, oh Allah save me from Jahannam, oh Allah save my family from great punishment, oh Allah give me Jannah and let me die on a Friday. And you have this list. But the problem is you never focus on that list. It's just a repeated parrot fashion list. You say every Ramzan, you say every Jumma, but you don't concentrate on it. That's the different technique here. The six du'as which are meaningful to you, which give you excitement. They have to, that's why they have to be big du'as. And that's why I've not made you write them down now. And I want you to write them down in your own time, somewhere, on your phone, stick it on your fridge, wherever, discuss it with your wife, and you could make six du'as together. And both of you, husband and wife, make those du'as together. Go to those places, secret places, and make those du'as and see if those du'as ever come true. And see if the different techniques work. Obviously, you've got to have yakin. I'm saying if, which is uh, not the best of words, because with Allah, we don't say if Allah. We have to have hope. And that's another reason, from the many reasons why du'as don't get accepted, Oh, I'll, you know what, this year I'll fast, I'll pray tarawih, let's see if my dua gets accepted. You don't test Allah. It's the other way around. You have to have yakin that Allah will answer your duas. So always bear this hadith in mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Ujibu da'wata da'i idha da'an fal yastajibu li wal yu'minu bi la'allahum yarshudun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I answer the caller when he calls me. Yeah, that's the verse. I answer the caller. Ujibu da'wata da'i So Allah is saying, I will answer you. And then we go into, then why doesn't he answer? Like I said, I'm sure every single person sitting here has had one dua which has not been accepted. So why? There's many reasons why ulama say when duas are not accepted, Allah is delaying you. Allah is delaying you. Yeah, like I said, people will make dua on the first of Ramadan. 30 of Ramadan, if it's not accepted, see you later. That's me and Masjid finished. I'll see you next Ramadan. 30 days his dua was accepted and boom, they've gone. What's the point? What's the point of fasting? What's the point of taraweeh? What's the point of coming to the Masjid in 30 days? My dua is not accepted. The point is Allah is delaying it. 
Like is with a lot of things. Allah tests patience. Number two, Allah will give you something else. So you wanted that house. You wanted that wife. You wanted that car. You didn't get it. Yeah, the girl said, no, the house got sold to somebody else. The car was given to somebody else. So you didn't get it, so you got disappointed. But maybe there wasn't goodness for you in that thing. Yeah, particularly things like marriage. Some, a guy wants to marry a particular girl. It wasn't written for him. So he gets upset with Allah. Allah never gives me what I want. Because you don't know what you want. You don't know what's good for you. What does Allah say in the Quran? Asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum. Asa an tuhibbu shay'an wa sharun lakum. That is very possible that you dislike something. I don't like that. But it's good for you. Allah has put goodness in there. That girl, you might not like her, but she's actually better for you. That house you wanted, maybe there was something wrong with it. Asa an tuhibbu shay'an wa sharun lakum. That you like something, but it's actually bad for you. So we don't know our taqdeer. We don't know what's written. And on the topic of taqdeer, I will mention another point connected to dua. Some people don't make dua or regular dua or excessive dua. You know why? They say, taqdeer mein jo likha hai wo milta rahega. Taqdeer mein jo likha hai wo milta rahega. Dua mango ya na mango, koi fark nahi. So there's them type of people as well. They don't make a dua and generally these people are not practicing people. So they won't even pray salah. They won't even fast in Ramadan. Likhayna milta rahega. Rozi likhayna milta rahegi. Which is theoretically very right. But it's a very dangerous statement. To me that's a statement from shaitan. Because when shaitan plugged that into your head. That jo takdeer mein likhay milta rahega dua ka kya fayda? That this person will never excel. He'll never change. Yeah, whatever he's been doing for the last 30 years, he'll keep doing it because he believes whatever's written in taqdeer is going to happen. It reminds me of the story of, in, in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, a man stole. Yeah, so the ruling we all know, in Islamic country, if you steal, your hands get chopped off. So when the man came to Umar radiallahu anhu, he tried to be smart. And he said, Umar, it was the taqdeer of Allah that made me steal. تقدیر میں لکھا تھا نا کہ چوری کرے گا اس لئے میں نے چوری کی it's not my fault so Umar رضی اللہ عنہ said کوئی بات نہیں it's in Allah's تقدیر that will also chop your hands so I'll chop your hands as well so this تقدیر that's why the تقدیر game it's not that ulama avoid it it's because it creates a lot of doubts and suspicions into people's head which can sometimes take you very far even out of the fold of Islam that yeah why if, if it's written who's gonna go jannat and who's gonna go jahannam why are we doing all this for just get on with it and put us in Jannat and Jahannam. And the people who go Jahannam, it's not fair on them. Because takdeer me likata. But we don't want to go into all that. All I'm saying is, don't fall for that misconception. Ke dua ki koi zarurat nahi. Kyunki jo takdeer me likha hai, wo milta rahega. Hadith me ye bhi hai. Ke koi cheez takdeer ko badal nahi sakti siwai dua. That's also a hadith. That if there's anything that can change your takdeer, it is dua. So focus on these things, positive things, which are going to make positive changes in your life. Don't focus on shaitani things. That I've been making dua, dua doesn't make a difference, everything's written. Dua can also change taqdeer. So it's very possible that a person's life, let's just say, was written 60 years, he's going to die. And then he does good deeds. He makes dua for a longer life, a good life. Allah adds 10 years on. He dies at 70. So, these are some points which I want everybody to remember when you're making dua and try and change your dua. Now coming on to some things which are factors in why a person's dua is not accepted. Anybody know what sort of things stop your dua and can be a barrier from your dua being accepted? Du- G? Alcohol. Okay, sins. Major sins. Generally, not just alcohol, any major sin. Somebody else said something? Income. income, haram income. Okay, that's the one I was after. So these two factors are main reasons. Ulama mentioned the haram income food is mentioned in hadith. It's a long hadith, which I will go through very quickly. That the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned a story of a person 
who is in the desert. This man, you look at his state, his hair is disheveled, his clothes are dusty, he's sweating, he's thirsty, he's hungry. Anybody looking at him will have mercy on him. But the Prophet ﷺ said, this man whose hair is disheveled, his clothes are dusty, he's hungry, thirsty, he raises his hands and says, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, Ya Rab. Look at his state. How much he's begging. You think Allah would have mercy on him. Allah is Arhamur Rahimin. Listen to the hadith. The Prophet wasallam said, Allah will never accept his dua. Never. Despite the state he's in. Misery. Anybody would have sympathy on him. His pitiful state, despite that Allah does not have mercy on him because the further hadith says, his eating is haram, his drinking is haram, his clothes are from haram. How will his dua be accepted? So from this hadith we learn a very valuable lesson that if there is somebody who has gone all the way to Makkah and he touches the Kaaba, where there are places that your dua will be accepted, like the Multazam. He kisses the Hajj Aswad and gets his sins forgiven. But his earning is haram. Remember the principle, his earning is haram. He's got an off license. He's a drug dealer. He takes benefits when he shouldn't. You're lying. If that person touches the Multazam, this is a hadith, it's not out of my pocket, these are my words, his dua will not be accepted because it's a rule. Haram money, haram earnings, same, he had haram eating, drinking clothes, dua will not be accepted. So this may answer for some of us, our question, why is my dua not being accepted? Let's take a look at our income. And I'll tell you, gee. Okay. Student loan, I'll see you after Salah. Now I'll answer it inshallah. It's, it's just off the topic, it'll take too much time. But I'll answer your student loan question um, after Salah. Haram money is a topic, I'll be honest with you, seldom heard in the masajid as well. Whereas for me, if you're going to talk about dua and ibadat and fasting and acceptance, acceptance is the biggest thing. In Ramadan, I don't really want to know who's stayed awake last night. I don't want to know who does a khatam a day. I don't want to know who gives a thousand pounds in sadaqah every day to this masjid or Syria or Gaza. Because Allah does not look at numbers. Allah never looks at numbers. Yeah, it's hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ أَجْسَامِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَىٰ سُورِكُمْ وَلَاكِ يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ Allah does not look at the beauty of your face and your clothes and your body. Allah doesn't care about that. وَلَكِ يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ He looks at your hearts. Who is sincere and your deeds. And part of the sincerity and looking at the heart is are your deeds correct? Correct. Are they tayyib? Are they righteous? Or are you praying salah in the first saf of the masjid but then your earnings are haram. You're lying to people. You're doing fraud. You're the local drug dealer. I'm not saying there's no hope for these people, by the way. Yeah, I'm not saying the local drug dealer can't come to the masjid. The one who does benefit fraud can't come to the masjid. Come, by all means. Sort your mamlat out first. Before you talk to me about du'as being accepted, sort your mamlat out. Because there's a big misconception, and I say this nearly every Ramadan, where people think, you can scheme people, lie to people, fraud with people. Fir hajj kar lenge, guna maaf ho jayenge. Hajj kar lenge, guna maaf ho jayenge. If it was that easy, brothers, then Abu Jahl would have been forgiven. Abu Jahl, I think I've mentioned his name twice today. You guys might think I like Abu Jahl. It's the example, it's a very stark example of Abu Jahl. Yeah? Abu Jahl was the custodian of Makkah. Yeah, You know how the Saudi government are the custodian of the two holy masjids? Abu Jahl was a custodian. So if that's the rule, ke had ho jayenge, why did Abu Jahl get forgiven? 
Why did Abu Lahab get forgiven? And all the mushrikeen? Because many of them used to serve the hajis. So this is a big deception of shaitan. You can't do that. You can't rob people, lie to people, <coughs> mistreat people. It comes under hukukul ibad. And then say, Hajj kal lenge, Hajj me sab kuch maaf ho jayega. Maybe the Hajj, another um, misunderstanding people have, so then how come he goes for Hajj every year? Tawfiq to milti hai na? Maybe it's a sign from Allah, change your ways. Allah ki tawfiq hoti hai. Ki Hajj me bhi ja rahe, haram bhi kha rahe. Ki Allah yaad dilata hai. Ki apne maamlaat ko islah karo. Change them. If you don't change them, then maybe a time will come, the hajj will even stop, the namaz will even stop. So don't ever think that, well, I'm not that bad, because I fast every year, so what if I do haram? So what if I do wrong? Those fasting, tawfiq, the taraweeh, tawfiq, the hajj and the umrah, is a sign from Allah, a reminder for you to change. So haram money, haram earnings is a big reason. Another reason why du'as don't get accepted is major sins. Now major sins fall into two categories. One is to do with hukuk al-ibad, the rights of the servants. And number two is the right of Allah. So somebody mentioned alcohol, drugs, gambling. is all to do with the rights of Allah. You harm yourself. Somebody doesn't fast, they're drinking tonight. They harm themselves. They need to ask tawbah. Allah will forgive them. But if you mistreat people, especially the ones closest to you, your wife, the wife mistreats her husband, the mother and father mistreat their children, we don't often hear that one, do we? Because it's always about walidain ke hukuk, walidain ke hukuk. Bacche ke bhi hukuk hote Islam mein. If you mistreat your children, that comes under hukuk ul ibad. On the day of judgment, they could grip you by the neck and push you straight into Jahannam. Something which is rarely heard. I believe in rights of parents. The parents have big rights. Paradise lies under the mother's feet. The father is the key to paradise, no doubt. But we have to have a balance. Islam is a balanced religion. It's a very fair and just religion. And whenever I talk about parents, I will always talk about children. Because sadly, in this day and age, we see a lot of that. We see a lot of parents abusing their children's rights, mistreating them under the banner of me baapu, me mahu, mere kadmo ke niche jannat hai. And that's another rule I explained. There are certain things in Quran, Hadith, you can't misuse it. A mother can't abuse her daughter and say, paradise lies under a mother's feet. If you ask ulama and do ask, that's so all these mothers who mistreat their children. Does that mean paradise lies under the mother's feet? No. If a mother is an evil mother, she is vicious and vulgar and abuses her children, paradise doesn't lie under her feet. And that's why I say ask this to Allah, because I've asked it. Because often in this day and age we see children, they are coming away from Islam, some out of Islam. And often it's because of parents. You can blame the madrasas as much as you want. Parents need to look in the mirror sometimes. So don't think that I can treat my children how I want. Allah will answer my duas. This is also comes under major sins. So definitely children who disobey their parents, major sin. Major sin. You are closing the doors of Jannat. Any child who answers back to his mother and father, who abuses his mother and father, who physically abuses mother and father, you have closed the door of Jannat. And feel free to prove me wrong that no, I disobeyed my parents, but I'm still going to make it. Even if you made it in this dunya, yeah, you became a CEO, a director, you became a doctor, a heart surgeon, there's no barakat in your time and money. Anybody who disobeys their parents, so don't think I'm just talking about the children, it's good to have a balance, but I'm also mentioning about parents as well who abuse children, because it's not often mentioned. It's not often mentioned, but Quran and Hadith mentions it. That children have rights too. So both have to fulfill their rights. And parents shouldn't abuse their rights. So this would come under hukuk al-ibad. And if you are misusing hukuk al-ibad and not fulfilling them, it's very possible your dua will not be accepted. 
So that's another reason sometimes we need to look at ourselves, our actions. Shikayat hum bohut jaldi kalte. Maulana sahab, das saal se dua karte hai. Das ramzan ho gaye, Allah dua kabool nahi karte. These are some of the reasons. Another one which ulama mentioned, which might come under major sins as well, is the breaking of ties. People who break ties, you don't speak to your mother because my mom upset me so many years ago. Your mom did upset you so many years ago. Learn to forgive and forget she's your mother. My father speaks to my wife and kids in this way, so I'm not going to talk to him. Islam says even if your parents are non-Muslims, you still have to keep connection with them. So just because your father got angry one day, your mother got angry one day, it does not mean even Ramadan you don't go and see them, Eid you don't go and see them. So this is one big factor why du'as are not accepted. People who have kata ta'alluq. How many brothers don't talk to their brothers? Grew up together in the same house. Now they're both married. Well, my wife said, don't talk to him. So I'm not going to talk to my brother. Your wife doesn't have that right. Your wife doesn't have that right. She's breaking families. And it happens. We all know it happens. That's why I'm mentioning it. A sister doesn't talk to another sister. So when you break family ties, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will close the doors of du'as. It sounds scary. But it's the truth. There has to be some reason why Allah doesn't accept du'as. And these are some of the reasons. So like I mentioned, try some of these different techniques. Um, there are many, many hadith and virtues which we hear time and time again. I'm not going to go into all of them. But like I said, I will mention it at the end again was the hadith. Especially when you make these six du'as. These six du'as which I want you to write down. Some of the things about these six du'as, just to help you, is like I said, it'll be something you really, really want. Something which you feel is impossible. I can never do that. You look at somebody, one of your role models, somebody you look up to. Yeah, for children, sometimes it's becoming a footballer. It's becoming something athletic, something to do with sports, and you think, I'll never get there. Make du'a. Make dua for it. The thing that gets you excited the most. For some people, it may not be things which get them excited. It's just something they've really, really wanted. Like I mentioned, husband and wife who don't have children. They really, really want children. Make dua for it. Go to different places. Yeah, Change your wording of dua. And this is the benefit of writing it down. Because some of you will think, nobody's ever told me to write duas down. The benefit of writing is the wording. Yeah? And generally, mashallah, women are better at writing and wording their du'as. And that's why I said, if it is something a husband and wife wants, sit together and write these things down. And then, look at your list. When you've got a list of six things you want, and remember why I said six. So it's not a rule, if somebody had five, if somebody had ten. It's a small number. My point is, the point of six is a small number, so you focus on that. The minimum is the 30 days of Ramadan. 30 days of Ramadan, you will focus on these six things. And you will repeat them. So your whole heart and mind is focused just on these six. And this is why we're cutting the big list out. The big list of things we generally ask for, the things mentioned in Quran and Hadith, you can still make them at another time. Nobody's stopping you. But these six things, you will choose your times of acceptance. And that's the last thing I'm going to mention. How I said change places, change your dua timings. The timings mentioned in hadith. Who knows what times are duas accepted? One time's coming very soon. Before Maghrib. Yeah, when your stomach's rumbling. So at the time of iftar, in Ramadan... At the time of iftar, du'as are accepted. So, how do we make this du'a? You can make it before, beforehand. So, what did I see? 6.35 today on um, your timetable. It's five minutes before at least. A good five minutes. Not 20 second du'a. Not 30 second du'a. Yeah? That's a joke. That's not a du'a. I'll be honest. 20 second dua, 30 second dua, you cannot talk to your Lord, Allah, who is Ghani, who is Mu'ati, who is Rahman, Rahim for 20, 30 seconds, and then complain, dua is not accepted. Five minutes. 
And if anybody sitting here or sitting at home says to me, that's too much, then show me your phone and show me your screen time. Show me your talk time. In a day, some of us do five hours. Average. In a day, out of 24 hours, four or five hours is on the screen. The young generation will be a lot more. Yeah, young generation sleep, they're on their phone as well. Don't ask me how they do it. But they're always on their phone, mashallah. So from that five hours in Ramadan, we should cut that screen time down. Most phones show you now as well. So it's something you should check. If you want to improve, you want to become more spiritual, you want to have growth, then you need to do these things. That's why I said at the start that the talk will be a bit different. It'll get you to do things. Because it's no point me coming here today, tomorrow, talking thousand virtues and nobody's dua changes. Then I'm, I've failed. First of all, I've failed. Yeah? So I want you to check your screen time and your t how much you talk on the phone in a week. Even if it's an hour a day you're spending talking to whoever, your wife at lunch, your parents, your brothers, sisters. Hopefully it's not gossiping away. But even if it's an hour a week, a day, sorry, that's seven hours. Seven hours in a week. I'm asking for five minutes a day. Time seven, 35 minutes. It's not even an hour. So five minutes. So one of the times we mentioned is iftar time. Do not miss that time. So before iftari time, so let's say 6.30, and inshallah I will end at 6.30 as well, just to act upon what I'm preaching. And sometimes if you miss it, Let's say you missed it, you rushed to the masjid, 6.35, azan's done, kajur in your mouth. You can make the dua afterwards as well. Yeah, you can, whilst you're munching your kajur, having your water, you can make the dua. The dua is a time of iftar. What's another time duas are accepted? The hajjud time, which normally 11 months we're sleeping. Yeah, snoring away. Don't talk to me about the hajjud. Ramadan is a time everybody can pray tahajjud, two rakats minimum, four rakats. And if you can't pray two rakats, you can't be bothered doing wudu, it's too cold. Lift your hands and make dua. Again, before your sehri, after your sehri, it's up to you. That time make dua. Yeah, which is about three o'clock, four o'clock nowadays. Mm, it'll go later when the clock changes. But if all year round, 11 months, you don't wake up for tahajjud, you don't pray tahajjud, at least pray tahajjud now or make dua. What's another time? Duas are accepted. It doesn't have to be just Ramadan. When? When someone is traveling, very good, mashallah. So if you travel, yeah, and you travel anywhere, you don't have to travel abroad, you go Leicester, Birmingham, London, during your travels, make dua. And another one? Fridays, what do we know about Fridays? 52 Fridays in a year. Fridays, the Prophet ﷺ said, there is a time. Sa'a is the word, it doesn't necessarily mean hour. It could be a moment, it could be a minute. There is a time. That's what I'm going to say. There is a time, a moment, every Friday. So how many Fridays in a year? 52 times Allah opens His doors of mercy. Anything you ask at that time will be accepted. Obviously, there are different times for this. Some people say it's between the khutbahs, which... We don't generally raise our hands or not even verbalize dua, but you can make dua in your heart at that time. So between the two khutbahs is one. Um, another time is between Asr and Maghrib. So some say generally the hour between Asr and Maghrib or just before Maghrib, some people say. So that's not Ramadan. So we're going to change, inshallah, how we make dua. Focus on few duas. The setting, the environment of dua you're going to change and then... The most important thing is the timings of du'as. And bear in mind those things which are barriers for du'as to be accepted. The major things, the major sins, haram earnings, and obviously cutting connections with family. Yeah? On that note, I will just say if, for example, somebody doesn't get on with their brother, their mother, or their father, your characters just clash. Every time I see my dad, I have an argument. Every time I see my brother, he says the wrong things. What does Islam say then? Islam does not say that you get on well with everybody. I will not get on with all of you in this room. Yeah, I'm just talking to you and you're listening. If you go on a holiday, we might not get on. You don't get on with everybody. Islam doesn't say you have to. What does Islam say is that the minimum 
you do salam. So if you have broken ties, I'm saying this because it's the start of Ramadan, it's time to swallow that pride, swallow that ego, and break the barrier and talk to especially family members. It's anybody really, even if it's your neighbor, somebody in the masjid, but if it's your brother, sister, mother, father, you need to break the ice and do salam. That's the minimum. You don't need to go to the house and have tea every week. You don't need to give gifts. Minimum do salam. Inshallah, Allah will open up doors for you and Allah will answer your duas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to make dua profusely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all what we desire, what is halal in this world and the hereafter. Ameen. Subhanallah bihamdi. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu.